messages up front. Pretty simple, ladies. Um, all the lessons I've, I've learned so far, they have to do with uh, love, followed by action, discovery, you see I'm gonna explore, and then innovation, as we have to be really creative and we have to innovate, because as you've heard uh, all day, you know, sometimes odds are against us, but with love and action, innovation, di discovery, I think, uh, you know, the dreams are unlimited for, for all of us, and I'm an educator, professional educator, been at MIT for three decades, and had the privilege to serve in the Obama administration, came back to teaching, because it's about the future, it's always about the future to me, and uh, so teaching and service are, are very high calling. You know, every day I wake up and say, you know, what should I be working on today that's so important? And I'll tell you a few stories about, about that. And I um, want to talk to you about uh, STEAMED. You might have heard about it as STEMMED. I am a STEM educator. I've dedicated my entire life to STEM. Um, but uh, if you're any Star Trek fans, so infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Thank you, Gene Roddenberry, to give credit to that. But it's about dreaming. I am the Apollo program professor at MIT. And so I was five years old when we landed on the moon. And I was in Montana. And that, you know, but it taught me to dream. It just taught me that anything was possible, any dream, because that was so crazy. That really was the literal moonshot. Um, so, but STEAMED, I always bring in the arts and I always bring in design. Why? Because it has to be inclusive. It means it has to include everyone. You know, so I grew up and I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm a rocket scientist, trained person, and you know what happens when you're in engineering school? You get weeded out. So at Notre Dame, you know, I probably loved basketball a little bit more than maybe my studies, but you know, I knew I needed a job. And so, um, but that weeder class, you know, sophomore year, right, more than 50% of the students dropped engineering. They dropped their STEM education because of bad grade. So they were being filtered out because if you didn't look like them and didn't act like them, then, you know, so what? They'll get different majors. So it's like, what? It's the wrong story. So I like to turn the conversation around. I like to open up the aperture and it's about dreams. You know, you want to get people to Mars, let me, great. You want to work on climate, great. You know, you want to be a superstar sports athlete, like so much here. It's just all about dreams. And then as an educator, it's my job to say you're in. Because I need every single body out there, every single one, every little girl, boy, they, I need, we need all of them. We need all of them, especially to compete, especially to compete worldwide. So it's really important to me, you know, to really get that conversation, turn that conversation around. You don't have to be the best in calculus and physics and math. I wasn't. <laughs> you know, that's the story. It's like, go with your passion. Go with what you love. And that's really important. And then I think we'll lift everybody up, whether it's in STEM or whether it's the historians and the journalists and, and everyone else, the poets and the prophecies, the philosophers, we need everyone. So I have a different way to talk about STEM, STEM, steamed education. I'm pretty steamed, I'm actually pissed off. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm from Hawaii, because you know, the public schools where I came from, um, there's no girls taking AP classes, zero. Zero took the AP calculus advanced placement, zero took the physics. Why? Because you know, they didn't have the chance. You know, where are their mentors? Where are the people lifting them up? They're superstars. They're genius. They're just genius sitting there. But someone has to tell them, yeah, you know, maybe has, you have to see yourself. You have to look like you. And you have to belong. It's not enough to see yourself. Someone has to, you know, open up their arms and love those little kids and say, yep, what do you want to be? What's your dream? And then empower them. And it, it just takes that, but it can take one person, as probably many, many, many of us know, just that one person that gave you a hug, loved you, and said, you can do it. Everyone else can say no. A million knows. But that one person that said, yes, you know, believe in that dream, you can do that, and a little bit of mentoring all the way. So um, STEM education, STEAMED. But that's why I'm, you know, STEAMED, pissed off. And I put a D on there because we have a whole little new generation of makers. And these are very, you know, they're making things, and it's fantastic. And so, again, if, if kids and young people can see it and dream it and make it, then they, they can become it. Then they can, then they can become it. Then they can really live full life, those dreams that they love to. Um, failing. You know, at NASA, <laughs> I was the deputy of the number two. I gave a prize for failing <laughs> um, because it was culture change. Because there's people running around with T-shirts to say failure's not an option. Now, that was great for Apollo 3, and I'm really glad we got those three men back. <laughs> But it's 50 years, you know, I mean, it's 50 years later. It's like, that doesn't work it anymore. That's culture change. You know, and we had to work really hard on diversifying because I got to NASA, I was so excited. You know, my first couple days, Charlie Bold, an administrator, Megan was there as our CTO, was, you know, I was just on a total high. And I get there in my first diversity uh, talk and, and briefing, right? 13% women engineers at NASA, woo! And I'm like, uh-oh, no, no, I didn't, well, I, I'm not cheering. 
Oh, but Dave, it's fantastic. 13% because 11% is the civilian, what's that called? The relevant civilian workforce something or other. I was like, I hope, I, I just, it just blew my mind. We're celebrating 13% women engineers at NASA. And they're really sad. Ooh, 23% women scientists. Are we sad? Oh, because the relevant civilian labor workforce, blah, 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 was 25%. I'm like, okay, we're never having this discussion again. Because I could, I was, you know, in charge of 18,000 people, and I guess I could fire a lot of people. It's like, no, I mean, it's just like, it's not just asking the wrong questions. It's like totally, totally the wrong. I'm like, parody. This is simple. Parody. You know, we reach 50%, plus or minus a few, I'm good. But we're not going to be talking about 13% women or 23%. I don't care if you're happy or sad. Just like completely the wrong discussion. And people were, you know, literally patting themselves on the back. So we have a long way to go. Um, so it needs a you know, huge, huge change in how we approach this. But again, storytelling, I think it's giving everyone an opportunity and it's realizing everyone's, everyone's genius. So I still give failure words now that I'm at this you know, beautiful building in the media lab because um, that's when we take risks. And you know, we might fail, 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 but we'll get it right if we just have persistence and, and keep trying. And um, how many, truthfully now, how many in here are comfortable with failure? Raise your hands. Oh, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Not, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, but yeah, on a good day. I mean, yeah. Right, right, right. No, neither am I. Neither am I. No, no, I'm not comfortable with failure. Are you kidding me? But I work on it every day. You know, again, what's the, what's the message? How can, we, how can we lift everyone up? How can we get people comfortable? So a few stories, a few stories here um, as on mostly in exploration, back to that love act discovery. So uh, we sail our boat around the world. Um, I'm still trying to get people to Mars. And why is this relevant? Because it's about, just was heard, it's about the ancient wisdoms. It's about, we went to 33 island nations uh, to survive, first of all, to teach kids uh, about exploration by Earth and space. They're all kids on, on islands. They're amazing indigenous cultures all over the world. They know how to live in balance with nature. They know how to live in balance with nature. That was a, such an important lesson for, for me to learn. I've been seeking that and thinking about that. And so um, just some of the you know, amazing, um, see it's sunny there? You know, we look good, good night. We only take pictures on sunny days, right? When, when, you're, when everything breaks, it's 30, 30 foot, uh, you know, storms, you're not taking pictures, right? So everything breaks, everything breaks. We lost our steering going across the, the Pacific. And um, that's a really long story, so jump on our website. But the short version is extra virgin olive oil, Ivu. Yeah, same viscosity as hydraulic fluid. Fixed our hydraulics, and uh, we made it. So we survived. So I'm here to I'm here to tell you the story. Uh, so I'm here to tell you the story. But I guess that's where the engineering and the creativity comes in. I did a lot of experiments until I found that one, and I was glad. Uh, so we went, uh, you know, around. But uh, it's, it's the beauty of these kids and their cultures and where they come from and the elders and, and giving thanks. Um, and then I think then I'm hopeful. Then I remain hopeful. So now I'm going to take you from the oceans up to up to space if I can. Why? Because I think it's a really important perspective. We call it the overview effect. We look down on Earth. All we see is humanity together, and we're all the crew, right? We're all teammates here, ladies. We're all teammates, and we know how to act as, as teammates. And that's what athletics te teaches us, and that's what sports, because I'm completely dependent on each and every one of you. I'm actually completely dependent on every life, life form, humans and, and other living beings so that we get this right. So that's how important it is to me to take care of Spaceship Earth, the crew. You're all astronauts. We're all this together. And uh, I will, and I spend you know, half my life trying to think about how to get people to Mars. Mars, it's not option B. No, 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 Elon, no. It's not option B. It's so we can find life. The evidence of life is a scientific pursuit, and it teaches us much more about Spaceship Earth and living all here together well. So lots more to say about that. We actually are on Mars today. Um, literally, I mean, that's our MIT experiment on Mars. <laughs> We're um, making oxygen. I'm like, whoa, what? Well, anyhow, this is a, that's for a longer talk. Carbon dioxide atmosphere, we split off the carbon atoms and we take the oxygen and we recombine the oxygen. That's O2, because that's what you need for life, life support. It's going to make fuel originally. We've got to scale it up. I can only make six grams right now. But, <laughs> you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to keep you alive yet. But, anyhow, we're working on it. You know, the point of my story about life support and keeping our, our, our earth uh, fine and, and making, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, so ingenuity. It flew, right? The helicopter. It's 
always about the people. It's actually not about the technology. It's about the people. It's about the teams. First time ever, ever, ever that we flew on another plane. So well, what? So it's not about the teams. It's the teams. This is 10 years, 20 years of people's lives. And they said no. NASA said no. We can't have the helicopter. I said what? <laughs> I'm glad I'm the number two. I'm the deputy. What do you mean? 50 million dollars? That's a three billion dollar. Um, rover, and it's just like a big brother of when we've been there before, but innovation, surely we can fly on another planet. It's really hard, technically. It's fun to talk about 23,000 RPMs that little, those blades have to move around. But for 50 million, you know, we, we made that bet on technology for innovation. Guess what? You know, you've always said the world, the world saw that. You made impact with the smallest, really the smallest of bets, just because when everyone else is saying no, we said yes. Of course we can, of course we can do this. At least we're gonna try. And if we have failed, okay, well, I would have taken the hit for wasting that money, but we succeeded. So how much is that, how much is that worth? How much is that worth just to try to take those, those risks and those bets? How are we gonna keep people alive? How are we, what, what happens when we, when we get there? Again, it's about finding uh, life, probably ancient life, probably 3.5 billion year old life. Because Earth and Mars, see, we're sister planets. I know Venus is supposed to be our sister planet, but really for me, it's, 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 it's you know, it's Mars because uh, we'll probably find, because Mars was probably wet, wild, wonderful. And that's really important because then it lost its atmosphere <laughs> and what went wrong? And we need to know that lesson. So when people say, we're going to get to climate change here in a second, um, for a minute, and people say, um, no, what can we do? What can we do at Earth? Well, we can study the universe because I got life all over the place, we think. We haven't found it yet, but we will find it in the next decade. It'll probably be fossilized, so my prediction is in the next decade, uh, we're going to find life elsewhere. Now, that'll change our psyche, right? That'll just, <laughs> that should just put us right back in our place because, you know, we're a little antsy to us, right? So, so we need that. We need that lesson. You know, humanity, I think, really needs that lesson. It's like, hey, we've just got to share this big old solar system and galaxies. Um, so I designed spacesuits and kind of shrink wrap people and thinking about uh, getting y'all, if you want to go, uh, to the moon or Mars. And... Um, so it's kind of interesting, again, engineering analysis, elegant math, math uh, this is kind of the elegant math that you get a, you know, it's called eigenvector analysis. You get this fancy Spider-Man looking suit. Why? Because, <laughs> way back, because my beginnings probably as an, as an athlete and performance is that how can I empower people? How can I empower people? How can I study musculoskeletal, you know, and performance and biomechanics and come up with a suit that really, you know, empowers someone rather than the 160 kilo or 300 pound big Michelin man suit that we have. No, that's not good enough. I still have to keep someone alive, but if you flip it and just say, you wanna accelerate the human performance, right? You wanna, I wanna make superhumans. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna you know, waste all my energy and you literally waste 70% of your energy in the current big clunky suit. So I'm like, no. And when I made a suit like this and it was fit, it's custom made, fit you know, men and women and, and everyone, it opened it up and all little girls that see this cool, great design suit, guess what? They're in. You know, I spent my whole life, decades, decades trying to come on, you want to be an engineer? No, you know, all these little girls going, and you just make them a form fitting suit with boobs. <laughs> they're in, they're in. Just give them, just give them, just give them some nice old clothing. Now they're, they all want to go to Mars. <laughs> I got, I got like all of them. That's all it took. Just give them a little shrink wrap suit. So we invent suits and technologies. And uh, we will become interplanetary. Again, it's not that it's option B, it's just right there. We're gonna send our experiment, I mean, the, the MIT and the meetup, just, just our little ants next and, and a depth camera. We're doing the technology development. That'll go next year. Back to the moon, I, you know, it's 50 years since we've been to the moon. I'm the Apollo program professor. And there'll be a few people like this to explore, to push your mind, just to blow people's minds, just, just to say, yes, we can. I think it'll be global, if I have anything to say about it. It'll be global, it'll be with nations of the world. It'll, it's soft diplomacy. It says, like, this is what we can do together. This is what we can do together. I think this is the most important lesson that we can share with people, is this humanity has this opportunity, we can do this together. It might help us get things right on, uh, better, you know, on Earth, I hope. I'm an idealist, but uh, again, <laughs> Just in case, uh, you know, I was a little, uh, I'm a point guard, right? Shooting guard sometimes, but I could never slam dunk. So I would like cheat and I would like get up on my brother's old truck and I would jump off and I would slam it down and take the picture, right? So on moon, super easy. You go <laughs> so that'll be the first thing I do because you jump like six to seven times higher. I wasn't so talented as, as she was. So, uh, but on the moon, bars were good.
Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the future here uh, to end up. We are really designing, building uh, human. We got, this is for H2O. That's not water. That's human version 2.0. It's here. It's now. It's what a lot of our work is doing under the. There's like, um, you know, these are neurons, like the real brain. This is the computer brain. It's not scary. It's not, it's not AI taking over the world or anything like that. No, it's empowering people. I was talking to someone out there. It's just getting rid of all disability. We actually don't see, everyone's able. Everyone has different abilities. And so the more we can do to really you know, con connect, and so we do work on prosthetics and limbs and new limbs and actually now a, a digital central nervous system just to empower everyone because everyone is super super able and that's our research and business is just to accentuate people's people's abilities and back to my favorite planet and mars is number two did i mention earth was number one my favorite planet for sure uh this is the media lab so this is um this is a whole bunch of data glad to share that with everyone um but we look at um climate we look at um moisture, we look at sea level, we look at temperatures, so it's really very holistic, again, from space, what we offer, we look down on Spaceship Earth, we look down on it very holistically, everything is complex, everything is connected, you know, and we gotta, we gotta get on this, because this is urgent. I still have maybe 15 years to get my people to Mars, but we have eight years and ticking to try to uh, make big improvements for Earth. It is quite beautiful from space, come up on space station, and the auroras, and we just mentioned the lunar eclipse last night. I think Bucky said it the best. <laughs> What's the task? What do I wake up every day and think? Well, just have to make the world work for 100% of humanity, I would add, and all living things. It's a big ask. It's a big moonshot. It's the earth shot. But it, it's, uh, it's completely, I think, doable with the right team and the right teammates. Um, so we study, we think, we try to you know, say everyone's in. We need everyone. It's about everyone's stories. Um, back to loving one another and each other, you know, back to what action can we take today because there's so much we have to get done. This is a pretty messy, screwed up time. You've all been through astronaut training. You've been through this pandemic. Um, <laughs> seriously, that's how we train astronauts. Isolated, confined environment. <laughs> that's it. That's just like, so this is, I'm just, it's serious. That's like all we do. So you've all been there and we've lost loved ones and, and family and things like that. So you're all, you know, you get your astronaut wings today. I'm just here to tell you that. We're all invited. We all must sit at the table. Everyone has to be invited. And it's about everyone being seen, you know, feeling like they belong and, and being at the, the table. Final comment for you all, uh, ladies, her story. And uh, so celebrating the great, um, you know, here in Hidden Figures, hopefully you've seen that. And it's all the women. Their stories haven't been told now, they're uncovering. There's so many more, all of your stories. I'm so honored to hear all of your stories today. You know, Eleanor goes, you know, she, I think she had it right. She's pretty genius. The future, you know, it's our choice, right? I sure hope it's our choice. We've got big, hairy decisions coming up here. <laughs> Not to mention with our Supreme Court, with all the violence in the world, so it's, it's up to us. So the sooner we take control, you know, I think the sooner we'll be in better hands. Thank you very much.